Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, for those just joining these videos, this is Body Talk with Rachel, where I, along with the help of special guests, talk about body image issues that affect different groups. My name is Rachel. I am a doctoral intern at the Counseling Center, and I'm excited to be joined uh, by Dr. Dan Eisenberg from the Counseling Center. Today, we're going to talk about um, body ideals that negatively impact men. Um, so thanks so much for joining. Um, Dr. Eisenberg, could you please just introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, like you said, I'm Dr. Dan Eisenberg. Uh, I am a, uh, a white identified uh, heterosexual male, a cisgender male. I've uh, been working at the Counseling Center since uh, around 2012. Uh, and um, I uh, am excited to be here, excited to, to talk about this and, and uh, you know, have this conversation. So thanks for having me, Rachel. Great. Well, thank, thanks so much for joining. I'm excited too. Um, and, and before we get into things, um, you know, you pointed out some of your identities and I just want to highlight um, that what we're talking about today is body image concerns among men generally, um, acknowledging that there's no way for us to, you know, be able to speak to all men's experiences, knowing that there's so many differences across men, especially when we think of the different intersecting identities, race, sexual orientation, among many others. Um, so everyone who's watching this discussion, please keep that in mind that we'll speak about it generally, but there may be, um, you know, a lot of different considerations to, to make as well. So to start off, um, when I first think of body image concerns, I think about the pressures people have about how they should look and the messages they receive about how they should look or what, what this ideal body is. Could you speak to some of those messages that men receive about you know, what is the ideal body that maybe they, they want to achieve? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Rachel is like, and, and talking about the different sort of social identities is so relevant to this too, right? Because I think mm -hmm. um, sort of in the US, you know, sort of broad US culture, um, we often have a particular ideal, but in other countries and then in other, uh, you know, when you're talking about sort of the messages that people receive are often coming from, uh, a, a white uh, heterosexual cisgender uh, perspective um, as those sort of dominate our media. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly the ideals are different uh, for LGBT folks. Um, certainly uh, there can be pressure from sort of different groups within those communities to present in certain ways. Um, and that's certainly true in different cultures, uh, different countries. I know, um, for example, some East Asian countries, I believe Japan is one of them where a very, very small sort of uh, body is a preferred body uh, for men. Um, whereas I think the ideal in the United States uh, is sort of predominated by the sort of large muscular uh, you know, sort of tall and muscular man, uh, which, uh, you know, thinking about sort of where that comes from, at least the, in, as far as I understand it, um, sort of I grew up in the 1980s and that was a time when you would see uh, sort of the proliferation of that body type, uh, which came from, uh, you know, professional wrestling. Think of like, if you're familiar with like Hulk Hogan uh, being bigger and uh, you think of uh, Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and movies at that time uh, were really pushing this uh, ideal of, of muscular power dominance, uh, also generally associated with violence. Uh, and that also having been uh, sort of just perpetuated throughout uh, recent decades. I mean, nowadays, if you think of any um, superhero movie, um, which is male dominated and you know, 95 percent of them are male dominated um you know there is a certain body type uh that is represented and is also um like you'll generally find uh sort of the gratuitous uh you know naked torso point of, of those movies um which is i think kind of almost like a requirement um even someone i think like um uh, even someone like paul rudd who is uh the star of like the ant-man movies you think of paul rudd as an actor he's not known for like that kind of body presentation, but he also had to get fit in a certain way to be like that um, for those movies. Uh, and so these are the messages and the, the images that are communicated uh, for men in our culture. And, um, you know, there are a lot of sort of pressures that come along with that for sure. Yeah, yeah, wow. Even highlighting that someone who maybe is perceived favorably like Paul Rudd even needed to alter his appearance to be in those movies is really salient to me of um, what this ideal is and it being very tied to this muscularity and 
and you pointing out that it can be associated with violence, but also strength too in that way. Yeah, yeah it's sort of interesting how it's, you know, a very specific kind of strength, right? It's a strength of, of power, of dominance. Um, you know, you're certainly not seeing uh, sort of uh, powerful lawyers or doctors having to look that way necessarily uh, when they are sort of represented in media. I think there's still a particular body that is shown in media uh, that's pretty uh, pretty narrow range. Uh, and so that does exist, um, but it's you know not necessarily to the, the ideal of, of muscularity um, that we see so often. Yeah, that's an interesting point that the body isn't actually required for most people's lives who are involved in physical labor or needing strength, but it's portrayed that way in the media. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Are there other sources of these messages that you think about? I'm thinking the media is such a large influence, but I'm also thinking about romantic partners playing a role too. I mean, for sure. I think you know none of us are uh sort of immune to the messages that we receive. Uh, and so, you know, anyone who is receiving the messages about, you know, sort of male bodies needing to look a certain way, then that like potential partners are also seeing that and maybe expecting that or thinking that that's a certain way um, that that's the kind of person they should be with, for example, um, which, you know, obviously puts a lot of pressure on men. Uh, and, you know, I think it goes both ways, certainly for women as well. Um, but then also, you know, as we sort of our, you know, are in a relationship, um, it's also generally hard for people to talk about uh, their bodies with each other uh, and changes that they notice or uh, insecurities about how, you know, they, they think their partner might want them to look. Um, and, you know, I think it's important that people uh, try to be open about that and talk with each other um, to not be uh, sort of assuming uh, that their partner wants you to look a certain kind of way um, and uh, you know to just have to try and have some clear communication about that and you know what that's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah that's a really great suggestion that we are all maybe subjected to these messages but everyone still has individual preferences too and having conversation about that is really helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about muscularity um, as something that's driving the behaviors of men. Um, and so I'm imagining exercise being very involved in achieving this muscularity um, right. and potentially over-exercising being a, a concern that men might face. Um, are there you know, other behaviors that men might engage in to, to obtain this ideal body that you can think of? Oh, I mean, when you're, Thinking about that as the ideal, like the, the two things that are most critical would be uh, exercise and uh, food intake and, you know, in what ways men might uh, feel the need to be more, uh, more conscious of the amount of food that they eat and the kinds of food that they eat. Um, and these things, of course, you know, can sort of merge together in the more concerning uh, behaviors that would be, you know, classified in sort of eating disorder criteria, for example. Um, so that could be, um, you know, doing things like, like ingesting uh, certain supplements to try and either put on muscle or to sort of cut fat as it were, um, things like that. Um, you know, having very restrictive kinds of diets that uh, people might uh, look to, to try and achieve a certain body goal, as it were, a certain kind of look. Um, you know, the, the sort of, you know, paying a lot of attention to your body and certain parts of your body um, can be really concerning. I think, you know, different times you'll hear sort of different trends about, um, you know, having parts of your body labeled in certain ways that are, you know, generally almost just like very normal ways of being, uh, but it, it adds, uh, you know, there's a, there's a label for it, like that idea of a muffin top or something like that, like, or love handles. Like these are things that are given a name and therefore you're, you can identify them and you can see them. And then because it has this name, it's this thing that's problematic. Well, it's not problematic. Generally speaking, the vast majority of the people have these things and there's nothing wrong with your body for having them and looking that way. So because this, this label comes onto it, we become obsessed by it. It can contribute to people targeting certain parts of their body with exercise and food and mm -hmm. uh, you know, really engaging in some sort of unhealthy ways of being. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point about the labels for our bodies and how those labels create negativity about them and a desire for them not to be there or to be changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we we have uh, so much of uh, you know how we need to like how we think about ourselves by how others tell us how to think about ourselves, mm -hmm. um, and you know the vast majority of people. Uh, aren't going to look like the ideals that are communicated to us. Um, and that's generally a, a, just a genetics and health uh, fact. I mean, most people can't achieve that body type unless you're having very restrictive diets and spending a lot of time with, with, with trainers and doing things to look a very certain way. Um, that's why people in Hollywood can do that because they can spend hours and lots and lots of money to do those things. And when you hear about what people do to go through that, to look that way, they're miserable. Like they hate it. I remember seeing an interview with uh, Rob McElhenney, who's the uh, creator of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, um, the, the comedy show. And uh, he talked about in one season, uh, his character gained a lot of weight intentionally for like the plot of the show. And then the next season, it intentionally lost a lot of weight and created this very muscular, very like minimal fat body like that we're talking about. And, you know, he did an interview about sort of those having to do those two body types for himself and, uh, and how his wife uh, very much preferred the heavier version, that it wasn't the super muscular ripped version that, that she preferred, uh, which was surprising to the like, host of the interview. He said, well, that guy is miserable, like having to be that guy and eat nothing and be in the gym all day. And he said, I, that guy was the guy who, who was, had a bigger belly, like he was happy. Like he got to eat the things he wanted to eat. You know, he went where he wanted to go. He wasn't in the gym all day. It was, you know, uh, like night and day. Um, and so there are some real like impacts uh, to a person when they're trying to achieve this kind of uh, almost completely unachievable and generally not particularly healthy uh, way of being. Yeah, yeah, what great points. You're highlighting the cost associated with meeting this ideal and, and wondering if those costs are worth it. Um, if, if perhaps you think this body is more desirable for your romantic partner, but they actually you know, don't, don't agree with that or don't feel that way, then it, it makes you wonder, you know, what, what is the sacrifice that I'm engaging in and if it's worth it? Yeah, and, and how do you even know that that's what people want? Like just because that's what's shown to you, you know, how do you, uh, how do you find that out? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think there's uh, enough, uh, you know, enough places that people are actually talking about uh, what is preferred. Um, and even though uh, the people who make the decisions in media to present these images, uh, it's not about necessarily what people prefer, it's what they want people to prefer, what they, you know, think people like to see. Uh, and, you know, it's not uh, true in other countries, you know, the other countries media doesn't have the same obsession uh, with bodies in this way. I think you think of like um, a lot of sort of like UK uh, movies and TV shows and stuff don't have this sort of the same obsession with uh, bodies in this way oftentimes. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, other cultures don't have the same obsession, but it also points out that our bodies aren't necessarily made one way, that they're like right. to this one ideal. And, and perhaps being your own body um, is what the healthiest um, for, for everyone is. So we, we talked about some of the impacts of some of these sacrifices people are making in terms of time, like exercising a lot, managing mm -hmm. their diet. Are there other ways that maybe reaching for this ideal uh, might impact men negatively? Oh, of course. I mean, when you think about sort of the mental health uh, impacts that it can have, um, you know, certainly self-confidence and, uh, you know, feeling like you need to, you know, look a certain way or you won't be desirable to, to uh, potential partners um, or that there's sort of something wrong with you physically or, um, you know, the idea that, you know, that is achievable, it can be so toxic. Uh, it can really contribute to people, uh, you know, just generally feeling bad about their bodies. And, you know, what do we have? We have our bodies in some way. And so it's important to, to feel good about it, to feel good in it, to be, feel okay to, to look at it. Uh, and when that isn't true, that can certainly uh, intersect with other ways that we see ourselves and feel about ourselves. Um, you know, I think about you know, what it is like for 
uh, people who aren't uh, sort of born with that more sort of idealized shape wanting to also engage in sort of healthy fitness activities, but not necessarily wanting to be seen uh, at a gym, for example, because bodies are so sort of that is sort of the focus uh, oftentimes at a gym. And so it can even turn people off from engaging in just good, healthy behaviors because of, you know, they, you know, people already know that they're not necessarily in that ideal category. And so that there's something uh, wrong with them uh, and they, they don't want to, you know, engage in that process of, uh, you know, being fit or, uh, you know, making maybe a healthy change to their body in some way. So it can be a, a real, uh, challenge for folks. And often I think one of the challenges for men is, um, you know, a little different from women. I think there's a general acceptance in our culture, certainly in U.S. culture, uh, that, you know, the pressures for women are very present when it comes to looking a certain way and uh, being seen a certain way uh, regarding their bodies. Uh, I think that's less true for men. I think there is some element of privilege in that for sure. And then yet men often will suffer silently with it um, and feel a lot less inclined to talk about how they feel about their body um, and uh, feel embarrassed by it or think there's something wrong with them for feeling that way. I've uh, you know engaged in therapy with clients over the years, uh, men who will, uh, it'll take a while for them to uh, talk about it, uh, that I'll not even know it's a thing that they're struggling with. And all of a sudden they say, oh, and like, you know, I don't really like the way I look and I actually eat in this very particular way. And, and so even in therapy, it can take a little while for folks to feel comfortable starting to talk about. It. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see that being related to some stigma there is about maybe these issues not being issues that men talk about as much. Um, but it seems clear that there, there are issues that men face. Um, maybe yeah. to some differences than, than women, but it's still likely to negatively affect them. So for those who are facing some of these challenges now, do you have any suggestions or advice you might provide someone who's struggling with body concerns? I think it would be really helpful um, for men to be more aware of the uh, sort of the range of bodies, sort of the, the range of healthy body presentation. Uh, that is not so represented in our media. And so there are sort of different resources online um, that I know people can, can find that you know, can really show you the different kinds of bodies uh, and different ways that uh, people can, can be and be very healthy and be very happy uh, in that space. I mean, I think it's great for people to um, just pay more attention to the bodies that they're shown. Um, I'll give you an example. And this is, this is not for men in particular, but um, the other day uh, we had a, a snow tube uh, was gifted to us. And so we got, uh, someone got us a snow tube uh, for the winter um, for my kids. And uh, it came with an insert, and on the in, in the insert there was a you know the product was they were advertising more snow tubes that they're selling and stuff like that. And there's a model that is is on each of these snow tubes. Um, it was basically uh, practically the same person. They were different people, but they were all tall, thin women in bikinis, yeah, and it wasn't advertising too. Right. Well, right. Well, they there was uh, there were pool products as well. Oh, okay. So pool products <laughs> and, and and winter. Yeah, but it was pretty, it was essentially the same body represented different women, but pretty much the same body. And I, you know, having two young girls, you know, I looked at it and I was like, I'm throwing this out immediately. Like, I don't care that they're looking at the, the toy and the, the thing and they're saying, oh, look at this, this would be fun. But the idea that they're seeing one type of body represented there, I think is really toxic. And I think it's important for people and men to, to walk around and see what kind of bodies do you see? Like, what are you being shown? Uh, and you'll find out that like, what you can actually see around you and in the world is far more diverse than what you're generally being shown. And just having that awareness and you know, recognizing that um, you know, we are sort of being sold something, generally speaking, mm -hmm. uh, in that respect. And uh, it's not how the world is. Um, and, and so working on that sort of body positivity and body acceptance just by raising one's awareness, I think can be a great first step. Yeah, that's a really great suggestion, really diversifying what we're exposed to and, you know, really reinforcing that there is no one type of body and there is so much diversity when we think of men's bodies. Yeah, absolutely. 
Great. Well, this was a really great conversation, Dan. Thank you so much for having it with me in this recorded setting. Well, thanks for having me. It was great to talk about this. Sure. And thanks everyone for watching. Um, and please look out for more videos. Thanks.